Just a couple of things about me. First of all, I've written this book, which is a biography of Tom Mann, a great trade unionist from England and from Australia. Another thing about me is that I'm very proud to be a lifelong activist in the printing union in Britain, uh, which makes me brother sister of the AMWU. Uh, first time I was here in Australia, I don't think that the Printing and Kindred Trades Union was part of the AMWU, but it's fantastic to be here now that it is. The third thing about me is that I can honestly say that I forged my entire value system uh, between the 6th of March 1984 and the 7th of February 1987, which was a period of deep retreat for British trade unions. And I give you those dates because tomorrow is the 40th anniversary of the start of the Great Miners' Strike. And uh, 1987 is the end of the Great Printers' Strike. The first was a, a defeat for the Great Miners, and the second was a defeat for the printers, with Murdoch uh, effectively gutting Fleet Street. Both of those disputes took over my life. But I, I think that although the miners were defeated and the printers were defeated, today we've got no coal industry, not a single coal miner in Britain. Um, and very few printers of big national newspapers. Uh, and we had great solidarity from Australia. It was the third defeat that was the worst with the longest term implications. Um, the first two defeats, the miners and the printers, was at the hands of the government. But the third was self-imposed when in the mid-1980s the TUC reviewed its structures and decided to do away with its industrial sector-led structure. Um, that, the great strength of that structure was that unions who didn't necessarily like each other were forced to come together and think about the future for workers and work rather than for the future of the union. And it kind of gave them a great sense as well. You know, what kind of technology? How would we respond to uh, um, the, uh, the climate change, to artificial intelligence? And so unions were not literally sitting in the same room to discuss those big issues. Um, uh, the, 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 st the structure itself was the product of Tom Mann, incredibly. So that structure existed um, from the war, through the Cold War, through full employment, through unemployment, and it was only the Thatcher counter-revolution that kind of did away with it. But that was self-imposed. So now when workers say, what is the union movement doing around artificial intelligence or the green transition, you're going to get lots of different voices, but you're not getting one voice. And that is a, a problem that we're dealing with. I think that if you uh, know what the union wants for its industries, then you'll know the kind of union that you'll get. And our problem is that we're thinking, first of all, what kind of structures do we want for the unions rather than what are the issues that are facing our members? That will decide the, the unions. Tom Mann was for fewer unions. Mann was for federation within sectors. It may shock you to know that I was involved, for example, in a campaign, Support the Drive for 35, which was, uh, took one million private sector manufacturing and industrial civil servants through the 35 hour week. But at one point, we had 22 separate unions at the bargaining table. The employers just loved it. Uh, Tom Mann would have said, basically, you need one voice. And I think he was right. He wanted unions embedded in workplaces with workers electing their own representatives. And he said unions had to have a political voice. And he said much more. Bear in mind, uh, we're talking about somebody who was writing in the 1890s. He said that unions were a school where we learned to trust our workmates and act as one in solidarity and for the advance of all, and that it would be through union education that the knowledge of how to survive under the capitalist system could be passed from one generation to another. 
And I guess that's the start of what we call union education and training. He believed passionately and went to prison many times in furtherance of the eight-hour day. He thought that union power plus the eight-hour day would change society. Eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, unless you've got kids, uh, and eight hours for enlightenment, culture, family, and community. And he believed that that is something that was needed across the globe. So life was much more than just about work, but the quality of a working life defined the quality of all our lives. If you're not earning the wages, if you haven't got the job security, if you haven't got the time to actually spend with your families and communities, then it's no quality of life at all. He was born in 1856 and went down the pit in what has been called near medieval conditions at the age of 10. From that day, his life's work became about the eradication of poverty. Not the amelioration of poverty, he wanted it dug up by the roots. So my book is only partly about him as a person, but it's really about how he developed over the next 85 years his thinking about how workers could live better. As an engineer, he turned first to religion as a way of defeating poverty. If people would live piously and morally, then poverty would go. But he realized that this personalized the issue um, when it was in fact a systemic problem. So he moved to trade unionism. Unions would resolve things at work. But then he asked, what about out in the community? So he extended from religion to trade unionism to what we call gas and water socialism, which was about building local government to clear out the slums and securing the vote for all. At the turn of the century, I mean, bear in mind, he was the biggest name in the whole world of trade unionism at that time. He decided to come and live in Australia, partly because it was, in fact, at least 10 years ahead of Britain in that it had Labour governments at state level and apparently even laws to restrict work to eight hours a day. If religion could help the individual and unions could help collective work, maybe government would bring greater societal change. He found the reality very different uh, with widespread poverty uh, and unemployment. So he decided he couldn't wait for governments to bring in alleviation of poverty. He thought the workers had to do it and so he started to uh, become, uh, again, a great industrial union organiser, and then he turned to syndicalism. He thought that unions should become centres of education and struggle um, uh, so that workers could effectively run industry, but along collectivist lines. Um, and we've seen the result of not being able to move forward it, with that. Like I said, in many industries now in Britain, they simply do not exist. And then, because he kept on coming up against the class system, he embraced revolutionary politics as a way of breaking down the class system. So he's gone from Christian socialism to revolutionary socialism, but the experience of Australia is pivotal. Other histories of Tom Mann effectively say that the great dock strike in Britain was his turning point. But in fact, if you study it, it was Australia that was his turning point, uh, and the great dock strike was his starting point. Um, his capacity was extraordinary. Uh, I've got photographs of him teaching Sunday schools at the Bijou Theatre in Melbourne, 4,000 people at a time, doing six lectures a day on what future is there for Japan, what is electricity, uh, why, should, why you should be a trade unionist, freedom and independence for India. I mean, this is in the very early 1900s. Uh, it shows how advanced he was. And along the way, he became resolutely anti-racist because of his activities in South Africa, leading two general strikes in Australia 
and in Hong Kong, where the British Empire, the colonial authorities, were hanging trade unionists that he'd gone to organize. Mann led the great dock strike of 1889, which was actually kept going by public money sent from Australia. Are you all aware of this? That they teach you this at school? It's the most important strike in British history, certainly up until the great uh, uh, miners' strike, when the entire East End went on strike and ran out of money after two weeks. And you may be shocked to know, but also pleased to know, that 30,000 pounds was sent from Australia in two weeks to pay for the families, to feed the families of the striking dockers. That's approximately 4.75 million pounds. So that's nearly, what, $9 million um, was sent in two weeks from Australia. The following year was the Great Wharf Strike in Australia and that was funded by the British unions, particularly the East End Docks, in return. He was the TUC representative on the Royal Commission of Labour and proposed the eight-hour day for all government employees and the nationalisation of the docks. That's 135 years ago, and the docks were nationalised the year that he, di he died. He refused to become the Minister of Labour in Gladstone's last government. He founded the Dockers' Union, Transport Unions, the International Transport Workers' Federation, which is still going very strong and currently has an Australian president in, in Paddy Crumlin. He was the first General Secretary of the Indi Independent Labour Party. In Australia, he helped establish the Victorian Socialist Party and led the miners at Broken Hill and the foundry workers at Port Piri in their historic strike. He was imprisoned in uh, a free speech fight in 1906 in Melbourne. At Broken Hill, he was tried for sedition and banned from New South Wales. So the Broken Hill miners <laughs> relocated him to South Australia and would hire trains on a Sunday to take thousands of miners and their families up to the boundary, which he'd be standing a metre over and he'd be giving his, his speeches. He was quite a, a boy. Um, when he retired as General Secretary of the British Engineering Union after World War I, he applied permanently to move back to Australia but was banned by both the British and Australian governments. I, I, haste, I can't believe what he would have got up to if they'd have allowed him. Uh, but many unions owe their existence in Australia to his work. In 1910, he returned to Britain and led uh, the, the great strike movement on Merseyside. The, to defeat the strike movement, the government brought 4,000 soldiers in to occupy Liverpool. Uh, the port city, and actually brought a gumbo up the Mersey. And the following year, he was imprisoned for calling on British soldiers not to shoot strikers. Three times he toured America and was expelled from Spain, Germany, France, and Canada. Basically, there wasn't a pub in the land that he hadn't <laughs> been thrown out of. Uh, he was an opponent of the First World War and one of the best-known supporters of the Russian Revolution. He became national president of the Hands Off Russia movement. And, and at that time, there were 20,000 British troops in Russia trying to defeat the, the Socialist Republic. And there was a ship docked in uh, Tilbury, uh, which uh, had all the munitions for those troops. And for two weeks running, man went down every shift change of the docks, saying, don't get involved in the war peace, let that republic have a chance to breathe and see what, it, what comes out of it. And the workers refused to load the Jolly George, which effectively meant that the British troops had to be withdrawn from Russia. That, that, that's how incredible he was. He became also the best known uh, leader of the left in the unions. Um, by this time he was 65. I'm 65 and I'm exhausted just talking about him, let alone thinking about what, what he actually got up to. And during the British general strike, we've got our centenary coming up in two years time, he was removed to Moscow so that he could provide a second stage leadership because they were arresting all of uh, uh, the, the union leaders at the time. 
1927, he went for six months to China, clandestinely organizing a major conference of Chinese, American Pacific, Australian, and Indonesian unions. And he did it all without a smartphone. Uh, in 1932, the government arrested him without charge using a law dating back to the Magna Carta. And the irony is that when he'd been in prison in Melbourne, he was visited, a solidarity visit, by uh, Keir Hardy and Ramsay MacDonald. But in 1932, MacDonald was the Prime Minister who kept a 76-year-old man in prison without any charges. Man's 80th birthday was celebrated simultaneously in London and, and in Melbourne. And on that day, the red flag was flown over the trades hall and civic halls. The London event had 800 diners and is called the most representative gathering of the British labor movement ever. The same year, he volunteered to go and fight in Spain. You really couldn't make it up, could you? Um, his application was turned down, but the first volunteers in the International Brigade in the British Battalion formed the Tom Mann Centuria. Australian volunteers uh, fought as part of the British Battalion, which was effectively an English-speaking battalion, and they died shoulder to shoulder under his flag, protecting Spanish democracy. Which kind of brings me full circle to the man who in the late 30s trained the next generation and formed union structures that would allow workers to have an important say in the future of their industries. And that lasted for another half a century. If you think that's enough for one life, man had two long-term relationships and was father to eight children. He spoke four languages and at his 80th birthday party sang fluently in Russian and in Chinese. He was a talented violinist, formed the Shakespeare Mutual Improvement Society, and was fascinated as a seafaring man uh, by astronomy. He was a vegetarian who ran a poultry farm. I'm waiting for that one to drop. And a teetotaler who ran the Enterprise pub. He, he was quite a lad. Um, you as activists are concerned with the now. But history is really important because that's simply the crystallized now of millions of workers in the past, some of whom are like Tom Mann. So I'd urge you to find out more about him and the achievements of the past, the better to protect the future. Mann would always finish his speeches with either three cheers for the revolution or three cheers for unity, but my favorite ending of his was, don't waste time clapping me, go think it out for yourself. So my hope is that you can now look on Tom Mann, not as an Englishman abroad, but very much also as one of your own. He was born in 1856, died in 41, into a world of wood and steam, where unions were illegal, children went to work at four, had no education and no one had the vote. When he died, it was a world of electricity and metal. Everyone had education and men and women had the vote. And unions were leading the fight on the home front to defeat fascism. Don't tell me that change is not possible. When unions are organized, change becomes probable. From what I've seen, young workers and those new to our movement and its ideals are fascinated by, va by the values and the history of our labor movement. I think that's encouraging, but it's also very necessary because as someone once said, those who don't learn from the past are destined to relive it. So my thanks to you for giving me the honor to speak to you and the time, which I hope I've not abused too much. And I hope that this interlude in your important work fires you up to fight the good fight more intelligently and with greater purpose. So I'm going to end by saying, don't clap, think it out for yourselves. <laughs>